If you put your mind to it, you can do it. You just have to believe in yourself. And welcome to Build. I'm Phoebe Burke, and we are live from London. I'm joined today by comedian, author, and jungle goer, who's taking her brand new show, Skittish Warrior, to the Edinburgh Fringe and on tour. I'm, of course, talking about Shappy Kosandi. Please welcome Shappy Kosandi. <laughs> Hello. Take a seat. Now, if you're watching live, remember you can tweet your questions for Shappy at Bill Series LDN, or if you're watching on Facebook, leave your questions in the video, in the, in the box under the video. In That's the what box. we're doing these days. Yes. Um, how are you? I'm really well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, great. Just getting comfy. Yeah, you must. There's a lot of hair on stage right now. I love it. You Do you know, know what? You know when you've got curly hair, everyone's always going, tame, how to tame your hair? And then today I thought, do you know what? This is just the way it looks. Yeah, it's how it so came out. I, yeah, so then I, came, then I saw yours. I thought, I should have spent more time on it because you've beaten me. I did a bit of tweaking, yeah. You did. You, yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. like the separated curls <laughs> rather than candy floss. All right, Fee. <laughs> the definition. But you've got the Carrie Bradshaw look. Have oh, you, thank you. No definition there. Oh. And people love that hair. I think, yes. I mean, it helps that she is, is yeah. Carrie Bradshaw. Yeah. 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 Um, so you're off to the Edinburgh Fringe with a brand new show. I am. Only for one week, though. Only the first week. That's the best week. I know. I think we need to explain to everyone how tough the Edinburgh Fringe is, for anyone who doesn't know what it is. I mean, it's 30 days of performing. Yeah, you perform every day for 30 days. But it's not just your own show you do. You do mm -hmm. There's loads of other shows. So if you're there for the month then you do loads and loads of other shows, shared bills, in order to get people to come and see your full show. Mm -hmm. And then you might do, like, the last show you do might be at midnight or one in the morning, and that's when you need to offload uh, with your comedian friends in the bars yeah. until six in the morning. So it's, it's oh, yeah. quite gruelling. No, no, it's quite gruelling, the Edinburgh <laughs> Festival. I don't know how we do it. And how many, have you done, how many hours have you done there now? Uh... Oh, well, how many times have I been yeah. up? I don't know. Loads. Loads. More than Glastonbury. So maybe, I don't know, loads. Loads. Absolutely but loads. Since, since uh, 19... Uh, s first Edinburgh I did was in 1998, I believe. And then I went and did a full show with... Me. It was me, Russell Brand, and a guy called Mark Felgate in, I think it was the year 2000. The heydays. Yeah, I think so from then on every year... Oh, my, it's relentless. Yeah, it's well brilliant. done. I mean, I mean it's, it's brilliant. It's, Don't it's, get me it's wrong. The <laughs> it is the comedy marathons. You've done like ten comedy marathons. I have done ten comedy marathons. Congratulations! Can I get round of applause? Ten comedy marathons. Um, so your new show? Wait a minute, not ten. It's 2019. Yeah. It's nearly twenty. Le you've done, but you've gone every every year, apart from when I had a. Um, <laughs> I can't count. I've one. had two years off: one for each child and one for a book. That's amazing. Well, it's it's heaven. It's it's an adults playground. It's um, comedians. August is what um, comedians call Ed Edinburgh. Is what comedians call August. Yes, right. Yeah, so yeah. sometimes you get comedians saying, "Oh, this year for Edinburgh, uh, we're going to um, ca we're going camping." <laughs> so you're going camping for Edinburgh. Yeah. So I'm not going up to the festival. So for Edinburgh, whereas and what they mean is August. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's an um, it's an amazing month, but you've done it. You're a veteran now. I am a veteran, like a queen, one of the queens, kind of a queen. Yeah, yeah, yeah one of the queens. Oh, um, when you get really old, people start calling you a legend. <laughs> <laughs> people go, "You're a legend." Is that you mean old, right? Yeah, I've just I just haven't died yet. <laughs> yes. Um, and tell us about the new show. Well, the new show is kind of fun because I've, I've toured it before I've done Edinburgh. Usually you do Edinburgh and then you tour it, but this one I've taken it all over the country and um, it's called Skittish Warrior Confessions of a Club Comic. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, that's in my oh, local look at there. Is well, that the, actually your guinea pig? Yeah, right now, this is what upsets me. It's a rabbit. Oh, wow. It's a, Am it's I not the first person to guinea pig that everyone rabbit? Everyone thinks it's that's a guinea pig. He's a guinea pig. It's because you can't see the ears. Yeah, well, the ears are tiny. Oh, wow. Very, very small little um, little man. He lives on the Isle of Wight now. Very happy there. Sort of got a little bungalow on the Isle of Wight. <laughs> um, so I started doing comedy 20 mm. years ago, really, like, and 
I I love live comedy, mm. and then the industry can really mess with your head when it gets all TV, and you lose sight of what you what you actually love doing, which is, for me, the clubs, mm. and that's where the joy is. And when I was on I'm a Celebrity, I just sat on a log politely until they let me out. I didn't really. It was, it, I wasn't in my comfort zone, but what it did, um, it sort of made me just look down at my life and my career and just really appreciate um, live comedy, club comedy yeah. and, and the fun and, you know, seeing the whites of people's eyes and and just really enjoying. So I wanted to do a kind of love letter to the circuit. So I talk about what it was like starting out in the mm. 90s. There are very few women on the bill. And I talk about in the show about how I'm no good at schmoozing. You yeah. know, I'm no good at schmoozing. And there's a game that you have to play. And I can't play the game at all. Um, like, I'll get invited to a party. I got invited to a famous rapper's party. And I, I assumed that he's invited me because we met at a party we got on. I assumed it was a family barbecue. I thought, oh, I'm going to meet his mum. And I went there. It was a full-scale media event. It was at the V&A Museum. There was a red carpet, a wall of paparazzi. Who was the rapper? Listen, I had taken a pudding. <laughs> <laughs> to, I'm guessing, was it Snoop Dogg or? No. <laughs> I won't say, because he was really, really sweet, but I just thought it was Tiny Temper. I, it, <laughs> I took a pudding, and so I didn't go in. Pudding? Right, it was a baked Alaska. That's impressive. Then I thought, That's impressive. Then I thought, but it'll be okay, because his mum or someone will be there and find a freezer for me. And that's always a good way. If you take, a, right, if you're going to a party and you don't know anybody, a real icebreaker is to take a baked Alaska with you because then you have to go around going, hi, sorry, I'm Shappy, I bought this. Is there somewhere cold I can put it? And right. then they go, oh, yes, like that. And then you're like a hero because yeah, yeah. you've bought like a, you know, nice sort of fancy, fancy. pudding or yeah. cheesecake. Anyone can make a cheesecake. No. Baked Alaska's skills. I went home on the bus with my baked Alaska. I didn't go into Tiny Temper's party. I couldn't. It was didn't a look. Even it turned out to be the launch of his clothing label. And then I was like, oh, my pea brain suddenly figured out that, yes, of course, because everyone that I saw there was from the world of media yeah. and stuff. And I just thought, oh, I see. I've been on Live at the Apollo. Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I don't get all that. I don't get all that. I'm like, you're on Live at the Apollo and suddenly, like, you're invited to loads of, like, parties. And then you kind of go, wait a minute. Oh, oh, oh my dog's died. I'll phone one of... Oh, none of them are my friends. But it's like this world of not real parties. And I guess when you're in the clubs and you're in front of a massive audience and they're there and they're real, yeah. there's nothing more real than that. No. Um, but I think people find the clubs... Like, a lot of comics... I work with a lot of comedians. They find the clubs really difficult. Mm. And, it's a, and I think a lot of the audiences... And I, don't, I don't know how you've seen it change, but they. I think a lot of the audiences are kind of... The same audience has been going to those particular clubs for, ye for years, and they're not the same as Edinburgh audiences. No, they're, they're not. They're very different. No, they're club audiences. Yeah, and they are. They're there. Yeah. To get their comedy. Um, yeah. But do you feel like? I mean, you've been doing the clubs for years. Do you feel like the audiences have changed in any way? Um, I feel that the audiences haven't changed. Actually, what has changed is more and more comedians go on tour, so people and and TV comedy suddenly took off. Mm. Um, I, d I think, like, after the recession, it was, like, cheaper to make. And so um, people went, st you know, a lot of people kind of did the circuit to get on telly. But there are comics who did the circuit because it it was a punk thing to do. Yeah. You know, there are comedy punks. They're the ones that are really off the wall. They don't toe the line. They're not interested in money or fame. Mm. They are club comedians mm. uh, don't get me wrong money and fame like if it's offered hi yeah <laughs> but that's not yeah but they're not going to polish up for tv basically no, they, they can't and yeah. and that that was what i found mesmerizing mm. about the circuit so when i first went to a comedy club i was 17 years old and i went in and this is so long ago they still had stripper grams right so <laughs> a woman came on someone had hired her for a stag do or something she took her clothes off everyone went oh well done and off she went like you don't do that now because no one strips in public anymore mm. for for money it's all done online yeah. right anyway <laughs> comedy's not my only addiction <laughs> so then um and i sat there 17 years old obsessed with this thing called stand up comedy just thinking it's just the most exciting thing ever and the compere introduces a woman on stage. 
And I was like, oh, wow. I genuinely didn't know women did this. <laughs> yeah. I felt like, you know, when they sent that dog up to space, <laughs> like her, like other dogs must have gone, oh my God, I didn't know we were allowed to do this. We can do this. It's not just it's a dream. Real. I can really do this. So I felt like a little Yorkshire Terrier going, oh, I can dream of being an astronaut. Yeah. And this woman went up on stage and she got to the microphone and before she even opened her mouth to say hello, she got booed off. She got booed off stage and that was the moment I thought there is no other job in the world <laughs> that I would rather do. That's amazing. It was, it's like, it's a compulsion. Like if yeah. a week goes by and I don't do a gig, I get really friendly at bus stops. <laughs> Hello, I've got some jokes for you. Um, it, we've actually had a social yeah. question from Paul Graham asks, uh -huh. what makes you so passionate about being a comedian? I think you're kind of answering it now. Uh, what makes me passionate about being a comedian is ever since I was a little kid, I have wanted to speak to as many different people mm. from as many different walks of life as I possibly could. And I think like a lot of comedians, I felt like a bit of an outsider. So it's so exciting to walk into a room, you don't know who these people are, you don't know what their politics are, anything like that, and you create a common ground where for 20 minutes, however long a club set is, you have a laugh together. And I think that's magic. Mm. And, and for me, that's, a, that's, that's the, the passion I have. That never, I never, ever get bored of that. And do you feel like when you're constructing an Edinburgh show compared to a club set, do you alter the material for either knowing what the audiences are like? Well, you know what can happen. Like you'll do like your theatre shows, your Edinburgh mm. shows, you take it on Very tour profound. and you'll take your whimsy, um, meandering stories <laughs> to a big ass comedy club on a Saturday yeah. night where everyone just wants. And you go, OK, you're not going to be interested in the nuanced little story I'm going to take you on. So then you pull out your your bankers, mm. your what you have in your armour. And that sometimes feels like that's the real gladiatorial part of mm. being a stand up. That's why skittish warrior. Yeah. You know, I. I Club comedy, this makes me sad, is sort of much derided these days. Mm. And people go, oh, they're just a club comic. And I'm like, uh, yeah. guys, they are at the front line. It's the hardest job. They're front line of the entertainment mm. industry. Mm. You know, they're the, they're the foot soldiers. Yeah. These are the guys, these are the minesweepers. Mm. We are the minesweepers. And I, I was lucky that I sort of got telly as well. Mm. I feel like... Um, you know, in Indiana Jones, when that wall comes down. <laughs> By the way, what? I had a gin and tonic on the train. I'm a bit like, whoa. I don't know if I should admit that. It's illegal. Don't do that. Is this live? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, do you know what I've done today? I've spent the day talking to three different classes of school children nonstop. And so, like, uh, you know, if I yeah, had yeah. one, then I'm forgiven. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> I forget things alive. In Indiana Jones, that, that wall comes mm -hmm. down and he snatches his hat. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like that. I kind of feel that I was lucky in that I got to stay a club comic and I got... Do both, yeah. You know, um, a bit of a, you know, TV, TV opportunities as well. But um, And do you feel like, I mean, there's a kind of uh, opinion that as a comedian, you should be able to play to any crowd, doesn't matter how tough. And is that something you believe in? For me, yeah. Mm. For yeah. me. I, I know people are from all, all walks of life, mm -hmm. and I love comedians who aren't like that too. Mm -hmm. Some are like more uh, performance artists. Some are very cerebral. But personally, I, I, I hear a lot of snobbery, yeah. which I don't like. You know, this is... Stand-up comedy is the closest thing we have left in our culture that's tied into um, very sort of vaudeville. Mm. And vaudeville was for the working classes massively you know mm -hmm. and now we have a situation where um oh you have to be degree educated to enjoy my jokes um and there is that snobbery that i sort of quietly under my breath go oh god's sake <laughs> you know it's like for me that's like that's nice but you're not the same you don't you're not punk yeah. you're not you're not um it's, yeah. it's not why i got into it you're not doing it for the people you're doing it for the critics yeah <laughs> um <laughs> Phoebe, I'm so glad because it's, you just said what's on my mind. But I'm always too like, oh, bashful to say what I really think. Like, yeah. oh, the bloke from the Guardian will like this bit. Yeah, yeah. Put you what on the club. Know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, we recently read that you were paid by the. This is a completely different topic, but we read recently you were paid by the police to use your flat as a stakeout location. Yeah. 
can we just yeah. for a sec can we for a second yeah my that's first. amazing what what happened well my I first flat that. um was in um off uh, brixton road in oval and i mm. lived there for a couple of weeks and i just got the police coming over and i panicked and they said no oh, no it's fine it's just there's some activity in this area and we need to keep an eye on this um particular spot that your flat overlooks and can we stay here for a couple of weeks so weeks? I yeah, they were there for a couple of weeks. Did they just, what, they came every day or they were there 24 hours? Oh, no, I had to move out. You had to leave? Yeah, yeah. Did they put you somewhere good? No, 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 I just went to my parents' house. You didn't even get a... No, nothing. It wasn't really? like, yeah, you didn't get a hotel or anything. Not even a baked Alaska or? No, <laughs> no, no baked Alaska, nothing. Just went round to my mother's and I think they paid me like um, £200 per week or something. Oh. And, you know, I was like, that's fun. quite fun. Yeah. You know, like, you know, I don't, I don't know. My it's life story, was different then. Yeah. yeah. I for, do you know, I forgot all about it until they did that interview. And I was like, oh, yeah, that happened. That's why I like this life. When you've got a sort of job that takes you all over the place and you meet lots of different people all the time and you're hearing mm. so many different stories all the time, like, you know, stuff like that can happen in your life and you're a bit blasé about it. Yeah. Like, I once met a man in a pub who'd just come out of prison and I, he came to live at my house. We all had to move out. It was terrible. Wait, wait, take us through the steps. <laughs> oh, honestly, I was so, I woke, we say now, but I was so right on. Yeah. When I was a student, everyone was like going, that bloke just got out of prison and he had to sort of carry a bag with all his belongings in it. I was like, oh, you guys are so out of order. Just because he's just come out of prison and he's hanging out with a load of students wandering around saying that he needs a place to stay, you all think that, you know, he's up to no good. So I let him stay in our house with his massive lurcher dog. And then uh, me and I mean, and there's my... a lot of alarm bells there. Oh, they all went off. <laughs> My life is constant alarm bells that I'm just stifling. You're like, no, shush. So I moved out of that house. That's amazing. We all did. We all had to go. What was he? What was he in prison for? We, um, I had this whole thing about we're we're. It is none of our business. He served. Never asked. Served his time. It's none of our business. I love it. No questions. Oh, no okay. questions. No danger. Do I'm just mean? terrified my kids will be that way. And I <laughs> just know if you meet a man in the pub that's just come out of jail, just smile and walk on. Just don't do what mummy did. Okay? Yes, buy him a drink and walk away. Um, and so, I mean, you're quite a big defender of freedom of speech and comedy, which I think is... Isn't everyone? They should be, but... No, yeah, they're not, no. are they? Which I think is really tough, because I think if something's a joke, it's a joke. And if it's not funny, it's not a joke. But if it's a joke... Um, but do you think, is that something that came from your child? Is that something you've always mm. believed in? And is that grown stronger as we've gone on? One of my first ever jokes was, um, there's freedom of speech in Iran, but there's no freedom after you've spoken, <laughs> right? And <laughs> the thing is that I know that other comedians have been a bit annoyed with me mm. sometimes when I've said certain things about the subject, but the point is they're not in my shoes. They're, they've never been in my shoes. Yeah. They've not had to move country mm -hmm. because, uh, a despot didn't like what their dad had. My dad's a poet, right? He's a writer. And we had to, you know, my parents have suffered because of lack of freedom of speech. So I come at it from a very different angle. Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely bizarre at the moment that we're focusing more on what comedians say and getting riled than mm -hmm. what politicians say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also like as a comedian, now, uh, you know, I'm talking about stand-ups here and of, uh, it's everything we strive to do is get to that part of you that you had as a little kid mm. where you have no brain to mouth filter. You say it, you say it, and that's the risk. Yeah. Right? That's the tightrope walk. There's that tiny moment where you don't know if they're going to laugh. And you're like, yeah. <gasps> and you don't know. And that's the exciting thing about comedy. You mm. don't know if you're going to fall. And the audience tell you when you've gone too far. You don't need like a, a sea of people on Twitter mm. who weren't there didn't hear the, your tone of voice, didn't hear the context, suddenly be up. I remember I had a sea of people, journalists, saying to me um, about something Daniel Kitson had said in a comedy club, you know. And they said, oh, he, apparently he said, you know, this, and it's racist, people have said racist, what do you think? I was like, I wasn't there. Mm. That's give, it, it. give me the context. That's give me all I have, yeah. I was not there. Mm. And, you know, and I just would, and I just did not get embroiled mm. because it's like, you know, we're not, um, we're not accountants, we're no. comedians. You've got one job to make people laugh. And if that's happening, then. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and, and also, I don't know, I don't know why now, if someone says something 
that we find distasteful, unpalatable. I don't know why we can't just change our opinions of them mm. and move away. Yeah. <laughs> just change your opinion of that person and move on. Life is passing us all by yeah. as we stop on Twitter and rant and rave about something that mm. if, if the internet didn't exist, wouldn't e even be in our periphery. Mm. Well, it's fueled by hate and everyone thinks that they can make it, that they have an opinion that matters and they should engage and you don't have to. Any, You don't. <laughs> you know what? Honestly, <laughs> I've stopped engaging. It's so liberating. Yeah. So nice not to just, you kind of look at some things, you go, oh, do you know what? There, I can see, oh, 50,000 people angry at this. I don't need to join them. I'm going to go and walk my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Go walk your dog. Absolutely yeah. great. Um, Sandy, that's all we've got time for. Oh. Well, thank you to Shappy because Sandy, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can catch Shappy's Edinburgh show from the 4th to the 10th of August at The Stand. Tickets are available at edfringe.com. And we're back next week with the cast of Netflix drama The Last Stars. Natalia Tenner and the cast of the Europe of... Um, I mean, of Europe and the Posh... <laughs> That's a lot of words. Um, <laughs> and the cast of Josh Patterson, so tune in for those. But thank you for Chappie Cosandi. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>